Hey everyone, it's Saoirse, and welcome back to another cozy tea and poetry time. Today I've made sure that my tea isn't quite as scalding as last time, that was a bit of a surprise, and I have one of my favorite mugs here, which is this one from my mom. It says I just freaking love moles, okay? And I do. I just love them. So. Grab your tea, your beverage of choice, and today we are going to read some selections from The Sun and Her Flowers by Rupi Kaur. I know I just did a Rupi Kaur book, but um, I'm just going in the order of books that I've read recently, and I happen to reread these one right after another. So. As I've said, if you haven't read Rupi Kaur, she's a very readable poet. I mean, you read all poetry, but she's readable in the sense that her work is really accessible and, and easy to get into, it's easy to comprehend, and it's very easy to put yourself into these poems and feel as though she's writing about you, or with you, or you've, you've come up with these things and she's putting them into words for you. So it can be very comforting. Some of the poems um, can be difficult to, to read in the sense that she deals with some difficult topics. Uh, but I always find when I read one of her books all the way through in one session, sitting in my comfy chair, I feel like I'm going on this journey with her and in the end feel much better for it. So in this book, um, as in the last one, it's sectioned into different parts here. So you can see in the contents, we have wilting, falling, rooting, rising, and blooming. And I like the flower theme there. I hope the rain sounds are a little bit better this time. I think I've turned them down. They were very loud and very stressfully distracting in the last video, I think. Um, but if you haven't watched any other cozy tea and poetry time, I just like these to be a little bit more chill and soft-spoken. Um, so. I will not shout at you at all. I promise you that. And for these, I, it's just casual. I don't really have a plan of what I'm going to read, so I'll just take you through some of the ones that I've tabbed, just a few of them. Let's see. I can still see our construction hats, lying exactly where we left them, pylons unsure of what to guard, bulldozers gazing out for our return, the planks of wood stiff in their boxes, yearning to be nailed up, but neither of us goes back to tell them it is over. In time, the bricks will grow tired of waiting and crumble, the cranes will droop their necks in sorrow, the shovels will rust. Do you think flowers will grow here, when you and I are off building something new? with something else, with someone else. <laughs> the construction site of our future is the name of that. She often puts the title at the end, which I like. I really like that, that analogy because that's what you are doing with a new relationship or with any relationship. You're building a future. You're building something that was not there before. And when it's done, and you've given up seeing it as this abandoned construction site. I think that's a really powerful image. I live for that first second in the morning when I'm still half conscious. I hear the hummingbirds outside flirting with the flowers. I hear the flowers giggling and the bees growing jealous. When I turn over to wake you, it starts all over again. The panting, the wailing, the shock of realizing that you've left. And that's the first mornings without you. And this is her illustration. That's one that really 
struck me because I'm sure many of us can relate when somebody breaks up with us and then we're you go from speaking with somebody every day to suddenly that's it, it's cut off and you wake up and I don't know if you dream a lot but I, I dream so much it's horrible because I don't feel like I sleep well, I'm just constantly having these insane nightmares but you wake up and you're still in not really like a state of reality and then you remember your real life and what's happening and the fact that you will not see this person again and that heartbreak happens over and over again every morning so for me like during those times in my life the mornings were the worst part for some people it's nighttime but I do pretty well at night but when I'm depressed it's the morning when you realize you have to go through this again that's the hard part I'm gonna have some tea I think I'm it's precariously placed on this table next to me. This is a mint tea, by the way, three mint tea. I really like this one. What's your favorite kind of tea? Uh, ooh, I'm gonna spill this. I know some people are a strictly English breakfast tea kind of person, or green tea. I love green tea personally. I love matcha tea. That's usually my favorite, um, but the taste of the mint tea is just so good. Okay, this one is another one that, that hits me in a very personal way. I tried to leave many times, but as soon as I got away, my lungs buckled under the pressure. Panting for air, I'd return. Perhaps this is why I let you skin me to the bone. Something was better than nothing. Having you touch me, even if it was not kind, was better than not having your hands at all. I could take the abuse, I could not take the absence. I knew I was beating a dead thing, but did it matter if the thing was dead when at the very least I had it? And that's called addiction. And here's the illustration. And this is something that's come up quite a bit recently when I talk to, um, when I talk to my female friends about relationships and specifically abusive relationships that we've been through and how it becomes a it becomes an addiction because they sort of train you to want this attention from them that they don't give because they're not nice people and when they give it to you then you get this dopamine hit and you crave the next time that you'll feel that and it's so infrequent because in these relationships typically the abusive partner will ignore their partner, they will put them down, gaslight them, just put them to the side when they're not hurting them. And so getting that attention even from an abuser becomes an addiction and leaving a relationship like that requires so much resolve and it is like having withdrawals because you're not getting that feeling anymore, the, the insane highs and lows that come with an abusive relationship because we tend to equate some kinds of abuse with passion and intensity and that's wrong and unfortunately it takes a lot of us a lot of time and possibly multiple abusive relationships before we understand that that's wrong. So that one, um, that one really got to me, uh, made me think about my own experience and I feel so very fortunate to be out of that cycle, to have finally broken that cycle after many years um, and now to be with somebody who treats me really well and I never thought I would have that. I really, really never thought that that even it could exist for me. Maybe it didn't exist for anybody. I thought perhaps true love, where both people are supportive and kind to each other, just wasn't real. Um, and my partner shows me that that's that it is real, and um, very grateful for him. I'm very grateful. So. 
keep hoping. I know how dark it is. I know how dark it is when you're right in it. <clears throat> this is what I love about these poems. It, like you can read them at different times in your life and they hit you in a different way because I would read this, I think I read this when I was in one of those abusive relationships when it first came out and felt, you know, devastated by it because I, I could see that this was what I was doing but I didn't feel like I had the power to get out and now I can read this and feel like I, I've made it to the other side. Let's see, I'm just searching for another one. Um, that I feel like reading to you right now. And look at the little, the little dog. I started using these little dog tabs in this book. Where do we go from here, my love, when it's over and I'm standing between us? Whose side do I run to? when every nerve in my body is pulsing for you, when my mouth waters at the thought, when you are pulling me in just by standing there, how do I turn around and choose myself? And again, this is something that I, I feel like has been coming up a lot. Um, when you're in a relationship that is all consuming and unhealthy, um, where you lose yourself in your independence, it is very hard to choose yourself when, when you feel like you need to choose to take care of this person who's using you. Um, choosing yourself is the hardest thing to do, but it's, it's the only way. And if you want to be with somebody, eventually you'll find someone who doesn't make you choose between you and them. You choose the both of you and you grow together. I always almost miss my lips and pour tea all over myself. Well, this happens with every beverage, to be honest. <sighs> I hear a thousand kind words about me and it makes no difference, yet I hear one insult and all confidence shatters. And that's called focusing on the negative. And if that isn't just the truest statement, it's terrible, especially, you know, on here. I, I make these videos because I like doing it, and I love the conversations that sometimes arise between other readers in the comments. And, and some of the comments are really nice, and, and you know, that, that's, that's what I do it for, is feeling like I've been able to help open up somebody's reading horizons and, and convinced, not, not convinced that sounds, but persuaded, I don't know. Um, people tell me that they've picked up books because I've recommended them, uh, which is all I want to do. I mean, that, that just means a lot to me. But then there's comments that I, I literally can't allow to be posted because they are so bad and evil and cruel. And those Sometimes they stick with me for a few hours. I've gotten a lot better. They don't stick with me for days. But sometimes they just get in my head and I think, why are people so mean to a stranger on the internet or to anybody at all? Crazy, crazy stuff. And I'm trying to remind myself to let the positive comments mean more. Hmm, this is a good one. When you find her, tell her not a day goes by when I do not think of her. That girl who thinks you are everything she asked for. When you bounce her off the walls and she cries, tell her I cry with her too. The sound of drywall crunching into itself as it's beaten with her head also lives in my ears. Tell her to run to me. I have already unscrewed my front door off its frame, opened all the windows. Inside there is a warm bath running. She does not need your kind of love. I am proof she will get out and find her way back to herself. If I could survive you, so will she. Again, I think about that with, um, when, um, an abusive ex starts dating somebody new. I wonder what, 
sort of torment they're putting the new person through. And I wish I could help them. Um, and I wonder, is that, is that my place though, or do they have to learn on their own? That just makes me sad. <clears throat> I do not weep because I'm unhappy. I weep because I have everything, yet I am unhappy. Remember that when you think somebody has everything that you want, or everything that anybody could want, and they're still depressed, don't tell them. You have everything. Why, what do you have to be sad about? It just, just don't do that. Yes, it is possible to hate and love someone at the same time. I do it to myself every day. So true. Meow. Give me a buddy. Don't knock over the tea, baby. Come here. Springer's in here. Come here. I miss my old setup. I don't know if you watched my videos from the beginning um, when I started a couple years ago. But I had a desk in front of me and the window in front of that and the cats would jump up onto the desk and walk in front of the camera. And now I don't really have that set up. There's, no, there's nothing in front of me except for the tripod. And so my poor baby's down there. And he wants to come up. You can get on the chair though. I know you can. If I am the longest relationship of my life, isn't it time to nurture intimacy and love with the person I lie in bed with each night? And that's called acceptance. And that is that is something that's so difficult to, to lean into, self-love, when we're so used to tearing ourselves down and making ourselves small for other people. Come here, honey. Come here, good boy. Come on. Come here, baby. He's so close to getting up. He's just gonna meow at me. Oh my goodness. Come here. There's room for you. There's room for you. Come here. In a dream, I saw my mother with the love of her life and no children. It was the happiest I'd ever seen her. And that's called What If. Come here. That just makes me so sad because I think a lot of us who, who have good mothers and have good relationships with our mothers, there he is, we, we sometimes feel guilt for, for the things that we put them through because they have sacrificed so much for us. And so to imagine, would they have been happier without us? It's very sad. Hi. Hi, baby. Isn't he beautiful? I love when she writes about her mother. That's one of my favorite things. <clears throat> Ooh. Can I get on my lap? How do I welcome in kindness when I have only practiced spreading my legs for the terrifying? What am I to do with you if my idea of love is violence, but you are sweet? If your concept of passion is eye contact, but mine is rage? How can I call this intimacy if I crave sharp edges, but your edges aren't even edges, they are soft landings? How do I teach myself to accept a healthy love if all I've ever known is pain? If I could pick one that just sums it up for me right now, it's that one. Yeah, because my boyfriend is so kind. The kindest person I've known, and, and all I've known from men before is pain and hurt. So it's very, it's hard to move from a place of thinking that that pain means passion um, into a place where you accept that that love and stability is, is more important, is the only thing, you know, the absence of, of rage. 
at first feels like a withdrawal, but then, and then it, then it's comfortable, and then you feel safe, and he makes me feel so safe. We're already running out of time. I'm just, I like to move so slow in these videos. <clears throat> his little feathers, he has to play with them. Ooh, I love this. I love this because my boyfriend and I are bakers. We love to bake together. Um, <clears throat> I'll have to tell some more stories another day. I don't have enough time, but I just love this. God must have kneaded you and I from the same dough, rolled us out as one on the baking sheet must have suddenly realized how unfair it was to put that much magic in one person and sadly split that dough in two. How else is it that when I look in the mirror, I am looking at you, when you breathe, my own lungs fill with air, that we just met, but we have known each other our whole, our whole lives if we were not made as one to begin with. That's called our soul. Our souls are mirrors. I think that's beautiful. I think this is the last section. This one really gets me. A child and an elder sat across from each other at a table, a cup of milk and tea before them. The elder asked the child if she was enjoying her life. The child answered, yes, life was good, but she couldn't wait to grow up and do grown-up things. Then the child asked the elder the same question. He too said life was good, but he'd give anything to go back to an age where moving and dreaming were still possibilities. They both took a sip from their cups, but the child's milk had curdled, the elder's tea had grown bitter, there were tears running from their eyes. That's so powerful to me because I think constantly of old age and how when I was a child, all I wanted to do was grow up. That's all I wanted. I felt like I was just trapped in this childhood that I didn't want. And <clears throat> now that I'm getting older, I mean, we're always getting older, but now I, I feel it so intensely. It's all I think about, and I, I'm talking to my therapist about this quite a lot. Uh, it's very hard to, um, to stay just in the moment. Hmm, there was one that I wanted to read, and I keep... I always lose it. I'm not sure how. Because... Hmm. Maybe I'll just read it from my phone. Because I know that um, Rupi Kaur posted this one on her Instagram for Mother's Day. And I thought it was in this book. Maybe I'm completely off base here, and it could have been in a different one. <clears throat> but here, I, I really think, yeah, it is from this one. I know it's tabbed. Anyway, what if there isn't enough time to give her what she deserves? Do you think if I begged the sky hard enough, my mother's soul would return to me as my daughter so I can give her the comfort she gave me my whole life? And then, Come on, phone. There we go. She did that illustration for it. I love that one so much. Um, shout out to my mommy. I love you. You're the best in the world. So we'll end it there. I hope you felt a little bit cozy. I wish it would rain. It just, after living in Scotland, I can't believe I can say that because I just wished it would stop raining. But in Florida, currently, it hasn't rained in a very long time. And I just want to feel cozy and snuggle up with a book and candles and... I love that slow feeling of rainy days. And knowing that like everybody else in the area is experiencing the same thing, so we're all just kind of feeling like little slow snails in the rain. Anyway, thank you so much for being cozy with me and enjoy some poetry. Happy reading. Thanks for watching.